Jennifer Player. I'm the president and CEO of Habitat for Humanity of Orange County, and so glad that you could join us for the second installment of our Home is the Key speaker series. Um, and this is in conjunction with the Keenan Flagler Board Fellows Program. And so just want to recognize our board fellows here, Hunter, Skyler, Thomas, who have helped to put this program, not just tonight, but this series together. So let's give our friends a round of applause. So research is increasingly showing that home is the key to a stable foundation for virtually everything. Few things shape our opportunity more than housing and where we live, and yet, we find that our leaders and our policymakers often leave housing out of the conversation. And so the Home is the Key speaker series was born out of a desire to connect some of these dots to hopefully collaborate more instead of working maybe on our independent issues in silos and hopefully also to raise the awareness of housing um, and the housing crisis that we're facing not only locally here in Orange County but throughout the country. So that is um, our goal. Our conversation last month in September was on housing and health care. And like I said, um, if you don't have the link and you want it, see one of us. We have staff members, board members with name tags. So see one of us and we can make sure you get the link from the housing and health care conversation, which was just really fascinating. And tonight the topic is education. So I would love to invite up tonight's sponsor, Todd LaFries. Um, from Participate Learning, the Chief Business Officer of Participate, and if I were in, I don't know, Milan, I would probably say Todd LaFrese. La, la Todd LaFrese. Please welcome Todd from Participate. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, my name is Todd LaFrese. I'm the Chief Business Officer at Participate Learning. Uh, we're located right here in Chapel Hill. Uh, we've been here since 1987, working with public schools in North Carolina and beyond to bring global education programming, dual language, language acquisition programming, and cultural exchange into the public schools. And so we're a mission-driven company. Uh, we focus on providing high-quality education programming uh, that seeks to be inclusive and equitable. And so we're truly working hard to reach students across the state and across the nation. Um, we're super pleased to be presenting, uh, to be sponsoring tonight's, uh, tonight's event. Um, as a former, I used to work in the Chapel Hill Carver City Schools as the assistant superintendent up until about 12 months ago. Um, and so one of the areas of responsibility that I had in the district, uh, I oversaw student enrollment in the district. And so I saw firsthand, time and time and time again, the devastating impact on families and children when they were forced to change their school that they go to because of housing insecurity. So at first hand, time and time again. And so I can't thank you enough for having this panel tonight and having this discussion, as well as for doing what you do. So thank you to Orange Habitat. Thank you to our panelists. Um, the work you do is so very important and, as you mentioned, connects the dots. Uh, it takes a whole community, and our community is very fortunate uh, to have you involved in this and supporting our community and our community's children. So thank you. I should also mention that we're going to get to see Todd's hammer, hammering skills out, participates coming out for a team build with us, I think, in a month or so. So that'll be, that'll be great. So thanks for all of your support um, and, again, for helping to sponsor and underwrite this um, event for us tonight. So without further ado, we want to bring up... Um, our panelists, if you all want to come up, and then we'll, you can just grab this mic and have a seat, and we'll introduce, um, we'll have you each introduce yourselves. And I have the honor of introducing our moderator, who is Ms. Deandra Rose. Deandra knows um, a thing or two about education. She, I have learned, was a substitute teacher, uh, was also someone who, what was it, S evaluated standardized tests for a while. Now she is a professor at Duke University and her research focuses on higher education in the United States. But what you may not know, and you may not be able to find in your quick Google search about Deandra, is that she is, well, she's a self-proclaimed troublemaker who likes to start impromptu dance parties, just a warning. Um, she also, I believe, ran her first 
um, political campaign at the age of 16, 17, <laughs> correct me, my story's better, <laughs> and was the either the first or the second African American Miss Georgia and University of Georgia. In your city. Yes. Yes, story, story. Just not. Just not. I should read my notes. Um, she's a fashion show model, and that she modeled in our fashion show fundraiser two years ago. And I learned this today in my internet research of DeAndra, which is a song that I played for my kids in carpool this morning. She can play on the violin. The devil went down to Georgia. Wow. I know. She's. she's yeah, a woman of many talents. Most importantly, she serves on the Habitat Board of Directors, and we are honored to have her as a friend and part of our Habitat family. And so welcome Deandra as our moderator, and I will hand this mic over to you. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Thanks, everyone, for being here and for the opportunity to spend some time talking about education, which... I'm a little biased, it's really what I've built my life and my research around, so I'm especially interested in this conversation uh, and really excited to talk about the intersection between housing and education. So just to offer a little bit of broad context for today's discussion, I point out that education is associated with so many other important trends. So people who have higher levels of education are significantly more likely to earn higher levels of income over the course of their lives. They're more likely to have access to occupations that are seen as more prestigious. So they're more likely to have access to benefits like health care and others that are associated with employment. People who have higher levels of education are significantly more likely to engage in politics over the course of their lives. So they're more likely uh, to vote, to contact elected officials, to contribute to campaigns. And they're also more likely to actually be mobilized by political parties and candidates. So there's, you know, those are just a few of the really important outcomes that are associated with education. So every single year in the United States, 1.2 million students drop out of school. So they actually are not, actually are not making it to a high school diploma or a college degree. And that's a problem. You know, that's something like, I found it, uh, 7,000 students a day who are dropping out of school, um, and one every 26 seconds. So what are some of the challenges associated with that? So people who, who do not graduate from high school are significantly more likely to find themselves in prison, they're more likely to need social assistance, um, less likely to vote, as I've mentioned, um, they're not eligible for about 90% of new jobs that are created every year. Uh, and they tend, again, to earn much less over the course of their lives. So this discussion about the significance of education and what we can do to provide access to it and uh, to facilitate educational access through housing is really important. So I'm so excited to have the opportunity to talk to this particular panel of experts. So Christina, if I could start with you, I wonder if you can give us a little bit of context about the connection between education and housing, just based on uh, scholarly research, and we'll pass a mic down to you at that point. Oh yes, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I'm so excited to jump into the conversation. <laughs> These people need no introduction. So if you wouldn't mind, so before Christina, we go to you, thank you. I wonder if each panelist wouldn't mind sharing who you are and uh, what you do. Hi everybody, my name is Riri Wei. Um, I live in one of the habit one of the habitat homes on Eubanks Road, um, Rogers Road community right there. Um, I've been there since I was in sixth grade and now I'm a junior in college. I'm studying at Guilford College, community and justice study major and forced migration and um, resettlement minor. And I do a lot of community service. I have to. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so my name is Christina Gibson Davis. I'm a professor 
at Duke University, um, and I have to say the number of rams I walked past to get to this building was, <laughs> I hope I still have a job tomorrow. Um, anyway, I study, um, my area of interest is the well-being of low-income families. Um, I'm particularly interested in how people form families and how um, they sort of organize themselves, but I'm also interested in social policy more broadly. I teach a course on social policy, including housing policy. Um, so I'm, I'm very um, thrilled and, and honored to be participating in this panel. Hi, I'm Penny Cressbuck, and I am the Executive Dean at the Orange County campus of Durham Tech. And I also wear another hat, I'm the Executive Director for the Community for um, community Engagement and Workforce. So um, I attend more meetings sometimes than I would like to in a week, but this is one of the meetings that is um, dear to my heart, because we certainly see um, at Durham Tech how um, housing insecurity really affects a student being able to finish even a first semester, let alone credentials for um, increased job capacity, et cetera. My name is John Williams. I'm the principal at Phoenix Academy High School. Uh, Phoenix Academy High School is the fourth high school in Chapel Hill. Many of you may not be aware of it. It's an alternative school. We serve approximately 30 to 40 students in our day program and in our evening program. We serve up to 12 students uh, in that program. Uh, many of you don't even know we have an evening program as well. That, that particular program is designed uh, to capture those students who have either dropped out of school uh, or is about to drop out and, or is working to support themselves and their families during the day. So we give them an alternative to go to the evening program. Last year, we were able to actually graduate eight students out of that program that would have definitely dropped out of school. So we're doing real, really good work uh, from that perspective. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you all for being here. So Christina, going back to you. Yes. <laughs> I wonder if you can help us at the stage a little bit with some, some context from academic research and what do we know about the connection between education and housing? So we know it, it really matters. So there's a very strong um, correlation between owning a home and what your kids are going to do. So we know that if you if your parents are homeowners, that you are going to score higher on sort of standardized tests, that you are going to complete more years of education, that you are less likely to drop out of high school, that you are more likely to go to a college, and you're actually also more likely to graduate from college. So um, there's a really, really strong connection between home ownership and what your kids do. Um, there's also research that suggests that it benefits the parents, which is one of the pathways by which home ownership can benefit kids, right? So we think that owning a home makes parents basically happier people, if you will, makes them better parents. And because they are better parents, because they're more able to effectively parent, that promotes the educational attainment of their kids. So there's a very strong connection um, that's been found repeatedly about owning a home and how well your kids are going to do. Thank you. So John and Penny, can I turn to you as education leaders? To what extent does unstable housing pose an issue for the students with whom you work? Um, I can speak from the commuter, community college student, and we don't have numbers, although we are participating in a survey this year that we hope to see more concrete numbers, but about 60% of students that don't continue to complete even a first semester, food and housing insecurity are um, identified as some of the critical factors that um, are, are the big barriers for them. So it's huge for us. Um, anecdotally, we see um, so many students that they're they're living in the woods behind Durham Tech, they're living in a car, they're living in a storage unit, um, or they're couch surfing. I'd never heard that term until after Durham Tech opened up. Um, the, we were the first community college in North Carolina to open up a harvest food pantry, and all the way up to um, the chief administrative officers at our campus, we were shocked at the need. Um, and after the pantry opened, we got a much better sense of not only was there food insecurity, but housing insecurity, and how much that impacted their ability to be able to even complete the first semester, let alone the credential. So um, we see that firsthand, and I'm um, really hoping that um, Habitat and other affordable housing projects will, um, will, will be at least part of an answer to um, improving and moving the needle on that. You know, uh, I'm going to speak a little bit about Phoenix Academy High School, but as well as Chapel Hill. 
uh, Carver City Schools, uh, we have probably a little bit over 100 plus families that are currently homeless in Chapel Hill Carver City Schools. Um, and when I say that, I, I mean homeless. I mean, they're trying to find a place each night where they're going to lay their heads. Those are the ones that are actually documented, where we know that we have the McKinney Vento Act, where we send people out or provide transportation to get them to school. Of course, we work with porch and table to make sure that they have food and all of these things. We have our hands on those that we're trying to work with. That is not including the ones that Penny mentioned about couch surfing, because there is a slew, just a, a numerous amount of students and children who are staying with friends and family every night. Now, and, and this is what's the, one of the more sad things about it, is because there are some families out there where they actually can't say we have a home, but they don't even have power to the home, no electric or water. And <coughs> speaking, you said over there, Rogers Road, place over there, Pure Fort, I think is the road. Uh, we had a family over there. They had no water, they had no power. They were homeless, but they stayed in a trailer. So they were called, they said they had. So it, it's very prevalent. And going back to all the things that you all have spoken on already, the impact it has, children are coming into the school, where first of all, just to find a place for safety, but they're looking for food, uh, sometimes clothes. Uh, sometimes they come in and ask for deodorant, or can they go take a bath over at the gym? because they just do not have. So you can only imagine the amount of emotional trauma. Mm -hmm. can, I, can I add something? So I read recently that approximately 97% of low-income students rely on their schools for internet access. Yes. Thinking about how higher ed or you know, education at any level works these days, you know, that's like a basic necessity for completing academic work. And so you know, thinking of, you know, just like you say, the, the types of resources that students rely on their schools to help provide just to make you know, their existence move forward, yeah, to survive, literally. Um, I wonder, John and Penny, do you notice any change in the magnitude of challenges that students face related to unstable housing, or have you noticed changes over time? I, I think you just have. I think you just tapped on, on it. Um, technology, for example, not having uh, what other students would consider uh, standard or normal inside of the home. Even if some of them did have, was fortunate enough to have a, a phone, uh, what you find is that they, <laughs> it's not uncommon, at least up until recently, for you to ride by Lincoln Center, um, where the school board is. And you'll find uh, two or three children out there walking around Lincoln Center while they're doing their own internet because that's how they're able to communicate with their friends over the weekend all over the place. So they're just sitting around, they'll be leaning up against a concrete wall right outside of my school. And they've gotten onto the guest network and they, they can make phone calls, text, and do everything when they hook up there. So, yes, you do see a, a difference. Um, and it's harder because you find children who are so glued to their phone when they're at school. Now, we collect phones when they first come in because we don't want to mess with distraction. But they are glued to that phone because that is their communication tool. And I don't know about anybody. Yeah, and I mean, I'll just add a tiny piece with technology. Um, at least in higher ed, I mean, you have, well, in, that's not, in, in education, you have a learning management system that connects the family, the student. I mean, we use Sakai. Chapel Hill School System use, power, uses power school, and so lack of that technology for uh, an individual who um, is is homeless or um, very, I mean, very limited in where they're where they're staying. I mean, that that's a huge, huge piece that really puts them at a, at a disadvantage. We see, uh, you know, a number of students at our library at either the Orange County campus or our main campus or a public library is is almost their home. And even when Dorian hit, um, we had a couple of students saying, oh, please, please don't close for tomorrow. I mean, we, we're their lifeline. Um, the other thing that's even more powerful, you think about the technology, but um, in, in my former role at Durham Tech um, as a full-time instructor, 
uh, in critical thinking and then again in developmental psych and um, a course called ACA, College Study Skills. I mean, you, you talk about tools to help you be successful, trying to change that um, dynamic of look to the left, look to the right when you're in college and neither of these students will, will probably be there uh, by next semester that you're trying to support them. So certainly infused in any any context, you're also talking about study strategies. Um, we kind of realize that um, what was done in K to maybe third, fourth grade, we need to continually do, um, even as adult learners. And so you talk about just a study space and um, having the materials and um, that, that, that needs to be consistent so that you're able to have an environment where you're learning well. That doesn't happen for somebody who doesn't have um, a house and a place to go to. In fact, I can remember two different students in two different semesters that all of their materials was in their car. And in one instance, the car was stolen. And so their entire semester of coursework, not just in my class, but their syllabus, their, I mean, everything that was gone. Um, and another, another student that that's just, I mean, so disorganized and she she quietly told me after class after about the third week I'm trying to keep things organized um, in my car but it's um, it's not working and you know thank God we were able to connect that individual with some fairly reliable short-term housing but it's huge Can I speak on one, other, one other thing just going ahead with your feeding on that particular question you know one of the things we don't consider we're, we're talking about education, the achievement gap, and the impact of homelessness and the housing insecurity in those areas. But there's a safety concern and a safety issue that needs to be addressed. When you look at people trying to find places to live, and children are, are extremely vulnerable to predators, and you know what I'm talking about, it's not just someone stealing someone's stuff, it's someone's taking someone's, uh, violating someone personally. And those are the things that we see coming into our schools mm -hmm. as well. Children who no longer feel safe in this world around them because they have no safety. When they leave school, there is no safety. They, they come to school to find, okay, I can actually rest. I have students who come in where they are trying to sleep at school because they have to keep their eyes open at night for their own safety. And this is just at Phoenix Academy, a small school, but it's going around all throughout all of Chapel Hill in different little pockets. It's happening. So I think that's what, trying to answer your question to Fidelity, that's what we're seeing at this time. Thank you so much. So Riri, I want to turn to you as um, the student on the panel. So you're currently enrolled in college, and you have also the experience of having grown up in a Habitat house. So I wonder if you would mind sharing with us a little bit of your own journey through education um, and, and what that's meant for you. So, yeah, I have looked in the Habitat Homes from all the way through middle school, all the way through high school, and currently in college right now. Well, I live in college right now, I live on campus. Um, my experiences growing up in the Habitat Homes I saw a huge shift in our family dynamic where we were able to do a lot of like family times and um, and since I was the child that speaks English a little bit better than my siblings, I was exposed to a lot of the adult stuff like our family financial situation and like you know what will that look like if we don't have this when before we got the Habitat homes we were living in an apartment in a two bedrooms apartment and there were eight of us and that was very crowded and it wasn't an issue like culturally we grew up like you know sleeping together in one big room and I enjoyed that but the issue was that those apartments like it has gone up so much to the point where like my family if we were to go back to live in the apartments we could not afford it so being able to um, live in habitat homes um, it helped us a lot in the financial part um, at the same time, it also helped me to also prosper in my academic. Um, I had a room to myself, and I was able to do homework in my room and do a lot of stuff in my room where like, I can stay in my room and focus. Um, but in terms of the other things, like as an immigrant and um, 
the first gen student going through that whole process of like K through 12, it was good, but going to higher education or like the normal education of trying to go reach college, I didn't have any support. And how does that look like? It was very hard. I navigated most of the stuff and I reach out to my counselors. And even I went to Chapel High School's informations weren't being presented to you. Hey, come to this. You had to go look for yourself. And there was a lot of like hidden information that schools don't present to you. And if I had knew when I was in high school that I could be taking a different path, I would have done the CSTEP program. I would have taken courses while I'm in high school and get my college credits done. Because now I'm still taking some of my gen ed. And it's boring. <laughs> <laughs> yes, because I'm like, I already took this in biology in high school and I'm taking this again. Um, but it has really helped my family a lot and we're able to like do things we want to do. We're able to like, take family trips and like, you know, buy a car. And how does having homes, you have a home, but at the same time, like, we're able to save money where we can buy a family car. So wherever if we needed to go to school and be dropped off or go anywhere, like, that's our access. And because of the habitat at homes, so my parents are able to, like, buy me a car so I can commute it back and forth, Greensboro and back to Chapel Hill. So that's my experience. It's good at the same time. Um, I was a lot on my own because I'm the first one to be able to go through, I guess, the traditional path of going to four-year college. Mm -hmm. yes. And maybe can I tag on a second point or a question? Has your trajectory shaped what you're studying in college and like how you're thinking about just the way you're using your education moving forward? Um, I changed a lot of my majors a lot because I wasn't clear what major I wanted to do, but I knew exactly what I wanted to do. Um, in Chapel Hill, I was part of um, a lot of clubs, a lot of outside nonprofits, and I was like on the student body board and a lot of stuff because at the same time, I also don't have any other things to do. So <laughs> I participated in those programs. But one club that really stood out to me was CORE, Changing Our Reality with a Small Eat Every Day. <laughs> and uh, we were, in that club, we were taking our faculties and staff accountable for some of their implicit biases and discriminatory practices in the classroom. So we make that, and because of that, it led me to other things where, like, you know, my, meet my involvement in the community and having a great community organization, the Rogers Road Community Center, um, had me going into a lot of policy work and living in the Habitat Homes. Um, I was involved with a lot of policy work, some stuff that like we have these Habitat Homes, but some stuff that we have to advocate, we have to petition for because it didn't come with it. And it also comes with a lot of like some of my biases now, a lot of homes that being built on Eubanks Road and Homestead, they already have bus stops. They didn't have to petition for bus stops. They have sidewalks. We had a petition for sidewalks. So those are the kind of things that led me to what I want to do now in college, studying community and justice studies, and what is it that the community need, not what we think that the community need. Um, so, yeah. Very nice. Thank you. Can I just pick up on something? I think what one of the things that I think you said is that a house can matter in a lot of different ways. Right, which is actually what the research so so it's not just that you have a house, it's that you have a safe house, it's that you have a safe where people aren't crowded, right? So that's one way in which a house matters. Another way in which a house matters is it's always the same place to go back to, right? right. So you don't have the stress of moving around and you can think about how that helps kids' education. Another way a house matters is usually the location. Usually houses are built in places with other houses which means there's more sort of a tax base, which means you have better resources, you have a better neighborhood, you have better schools. So that's also kind of why a house can, can matter. And a house can also help a family, as you said, afford other things. And so what we know is that people who have houses tend to be wealthier. And one of the things that wealth brings is it makes their kids more likely to go to college. And so then that sort of breaks, also breaks the cycle. So just to sort of encourage us to think about it's not just having the house itself, but I think as you were saying so well, there are a lot of ways in which a house, having a house matters um, that then manifests itself in these educational opportunities. Christina, may I ask a tag on a question for you just about research? 
in this area. I feel like those findings are so powerful. And I wonder about the extent to which there's support for producing that kind of research. Yeah, there, there's lots of evidence that suggests that those things that I, that I mentioned, that living in a place that isn't crowded, that living in the same place for a long periods of time, that having, not spending all of your money on housing so you can save up money either to take trips, and there's really strong evidence about when parents have extra money, they tend to save for their kids for college, and that makes a, a, a lot of difference. And then there's a, a large, large literature about the neighborhood and how important the neighborhood is. And again, the neighborhoods that tend to be the more desirable places to live tend to be those that have houses in them and not just lots and lots of apartment buildings. So the neighborhood matters because it influences the amount of green space you have and the school you go to and whether there's a hospital nearby and whether it's safe to walk after dark. So. When we talk about the importance of home, that's definitely, that is important, but it also represents these sort of all these factors that then contribute to how kids are going to be doing, uh, again, both in the short and the long, the long term. Thank you. So Penny, I wonder, are there things that Durham Tech and other schools can do at, at the higher ed level to promote affordable housing? Um, and I'm, I'm wondering especially if you can think of ways that you would suggest could be really powerful for helping kids stay in school? I mean, I, I think Christina probably answered that question already and, and better better than, than me, but I mean, certainly the, um, certainly the more the community, meaning the educational system along with the community, is involved in the conversation and support um, and even, even sweat equity in affordable housing, that matters, matters immensely. We are in conversation both with the Durham Habitat and Orange just about how that mix helps. I'll just use um, this summer, I was fortunate enough to attend the ribbon cutting for part of the Waterstone community that um, is building housing for um, senior living and to stay in place. And so you might be thinking, what's the education or what's the connection with education? But one of the individuals that um, was in the first of the seven homes is a Durham Tech student and in her, I don't think she would mind my saying this, in her late 50s and finishing a first credential that, um, uh, and a plan to, to stack some additional credentials to be able to continue to work for the next 10 to 15 years in a career path that she really enjoys compared to what she had done for years. And um, she's surrounded by um, neighbors now that um, have that similar support system for her. So, um, so it matters. And I mean, you certainly can see um, colleges and universities that are surrounded by neighborhoods that have community and support. Even if it's you know dorms, there's uh, you, know, you have a common connection with um, supporting education. So. I don't think I answered your question really well, but certainly, it's certainly, um, we, we also have a number of students that provide um, service learning, and a great majority of our students that are doing service learning, whether it's with Habitat or um, at our food pantry, continue to want to give back when they've gotten some kind of support. So if you do, um, if, if you're involved in Habitat, I think it encourages you to be, just like Riri said, I mean, she's doing how many more service kinds of things from that. So I think it. It, that entrepreneurial giving spirit is reinforced. So John, I'm curious about the connection between financial support for schools, especially targeted toward low-income schools and student achievement. So there, you know, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about whether there's a connection between increased financial support for low-income schools and higher test scores, for example, um, and, and maybe what you would recommend for increasing achievement? You know, I, I think that we can get lost real, real quickly uh, talking about finances and education uh, because you can't throw finances at education and think things will change. Uh, what you have to have is people who care involved in education. And, uh, you know, you can put all the money out there that you want and you can have the best looking buildings and you can buy, provide uh, transportation that's going to get the kids there and the bus drivers and you have good food. But if you don't have teachers and administrators and a community that really cares about every single person in that community, 
education is still compromised because every child is compromised. Uh, it requires, and I just believe so, I, I don't want to mislead anyone to start talking about, well, I think money is really important. Yes, it's great. But the heart of a person who cares is so much more. And I would take uh, that uh, a person who comes to me that does, that is going to take a pay cut, which is happening at this very moment at, at my school. I have a staff member who's about to come to me to take a pay cut and says, I want to come to work at Phoenix to serve those children because they need me. I'll take that any day over uh, an increase in my budget, you know, because that, that won't make it for me. So there is a correlation, but it's not the most important. What do you look for for teammates, or team, team members? You know, when you're, if you're recruiting or looking for teachers or people who you want on your team. I'm going to give you an example. This is so neat. Um, about four years ago, uh, five years ago, I hired a counselor. Her, her name is Eve Lipner. Uh, she had just graduated from UNC counseling program, master's counseling program. She's 20, just turned 23 years old. And I'm interviewing her, and it's not a real strong interview. I mean, she's doing her thing, and I tell the story all the time. She's doing her thing, and she's talking, and I'm having an interview. At the end, I always ask, there's two questions I ask at the end. Number one, is there anything that you wanted to share with us that we just did not ask the right question? You know how people prepare. Did, you, did we ask you the right question? And the last question is, what are your questions for us? Because I believe the interviews should be two way instead of just one way. So I asked her the question, and she said a few words about to finish it up, and then I asked and she asked her some, her some questions, questions. And she got ready to leave, and she said this to me. She said, I thank you for the interview. Whether you hire me or not, I am not going to stop until I find a school that is serving children who've been disenfranchised where I can work. <coughs> and I walk out the door, turn back in, and said, I got my counselor. <laughs> And I said about four years ago, this is what happened, maybe five. And Dr. LaFreeze can tell you, he used to be my supervisor. <laughs> about five years ago, Phoenix Academy High School started sending children to Durham Tech while they were at their alternative school at, in, in Chapel Hill. The first time in the history. Now we have 12 students, no, eight students taking honors classes at Phoenix Academy High School, their alternative school in Chapel Hill. Uh, and this is the credit I give to Eve Lipner that I hired, who set that program up. My teachers, uh, we have coaches coming in, making sure that we're teaching honors level at the district level. My teachers, I'll put those 15 against any 15 selected. The ones that I serve are absolutely amazing, and the change that we have had in this school, I give them credit. My only gift that I have is being able to, to select the best people, and they do everything else. It's amazing. Okay. Thank you. So I love this idea of education and transformation. So I have a question for Riri uh, related to this. I'm wondering, maybe if you could tell us a little bit about your thoughts on just the long-term value of education and its capacity to be transformative. And I know that you've been thinking a lot about, as you say, like communities and politics and, you know, maybe even access to quality schools. You know, what are your thoughts on this? This is the question I've been thinking a lot out of all the questions that you'll be asking me. Um, The question of like the long-term goals for education, um, for me, I feel like I am on the track that I want to be because of one thing that I have that my other peers may not have. And I'm just going to bring out like one of them is education can also be, well, the system of it and how they work can be a form of oppression, which is like not accepting undocumented students. That is something that has been weighing heavy on my heart because I was born undocumented. And 
Being able to be here in the United States, I have my residency and I've become a U.S. citizen, I have the opportunity to be able to, I guess in a way, live my American dreams. And now I'm in college and I love what I'm doing because of that little small access. It doesn't make a difference for some people, but it does make a difference for a student like me. And a lot of times, I guess with the barriers of accessing education and even barriers of accessing homes, like for a lot of people in Chapel Hill, I know plenty of community members who are undocumented. And I hope that they're able to apply for Habitat Homes because I know a lot of them need them. It's not just like, oh, they don't deserve it. They do deserve it. They need it. They pay their taxes. They send their kids to school. Most of the kids are growing up here, but their kids will still fall into that cycle if they do not have a safe home to live in. So, and it's, my mind is blurred when thinking about like what is the long term for education. Education is not for everyone, but education can free a lot of people. And it has freed me, and I want to go more. After I graduate, I want to go to law school. And, but that is because of that small thing. And that's something that I want to bring to you all, that like a home is a home. And you'll feel like you belong when you feel it, that it's a sense of home. But for me, sometimes I feel like because my peers don't have a home like I have, my fight is not done yet. And I want to continue to advocate for that. And I want my peers to be able, to, in Chapel Hill, to be able to even have the opportunity to apply because and Todd talked about earlier how like you know redistricting affects students and how they're not able to stay and like in the same school, whatever. It's happening. Schools are sending out emails to community members who have been sending their kids there for many years and now they're being sending emails. Can you volunteer if your kids would go to McDougal or Cobras when they live five or less than five miles away from Smith? If this is happening and I'm going to over and over say these stuff like, you know, redistricting and building your homes in some ways affect low-income families. And that will impact the education. I'm not sure if it's going to impact my little siblings. My little siblings are still living with my parents. I mean, I'm still living it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what would that look like if all of a sudden they say, oh, can you volunteer to go to Colbert because Smith is getting crowded? That's not going to be helpful because that won't be easy for my parents to go pick them up. So a lot of it right now, it's very like, you know, all these policies happening will affect the long-term educations and how that would look like. I don't have an answer, but this is like what I'm seeing right now. Yeah. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. So Christina, you know, at Habitat, we're moving toward uh, working to build more mixed income communities. And I wonder if you could give us some insight into the value of economic integration for neighborhoods. Yeah, so I think this speaks to the question of what is it the house or is it the neighborhood, right? Um, and there's a lot of evidence that suggests it's just as much about the neighborhood as it is about the house. So if you think about if you had a house in a neighborhood where the socioeconomic status was really low and people struggled a lot with poverty and 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 sort of the things that go around with that, the, the outcomes of that kid are not going to be as good as if that same house, same physical structure is in a neighborhood where there are fewer families struggling with poverty and fewer of those kinds of issues that accompany poverty. So there, um, and there's this really interesting research that looks at how these kids, like you, if you move, they've done these experiments where they look at, they, they move kids, they move families, and the, the, the families that move to what we call like sort of more socioeconomically advantaged neighborhoods, so neighborhoods with less poverty, more people working, um, less reliance on sort of social services. Their kids, when they're adults, do much, much better than kids who don't get to make those moves. So I think part of the advantage of living in a mixed income neighborhood is as much about the neighborhood itself and the access to that. And, I, and just one other thing is it's also about your peers, right? So it's about who you grew up with who you play with, and then what you think is normal to do, right? So if you grow up in a neighborhood where no one is going to college, 
where everyone is tending to have kids at a pretty young age. No one is finding like a long-term romantic partner, and that's what you, and everyone is working at these sort of not so great jobs that play hourly wage, and that's what's normal, right? That's what you're gonna think is normal. But if you're exposed to kids who maybe are going to college, maybe for the first time, right? Then you start thinking, well, that if they can do it, like I play with them, they can do it, I can do it too. So again, I think there, there are a lot of advantages that come with the context in which that house may be um, embedded, if you will. Thank you so much. Um, so a final question for the entire panel, and I'll start down here with John, if that's okay. Um, so at, at Orange County Habitat, we've been thinking a lot about advocacy and raising awareness about policy issues related to affordable housing uh, with our policymakers and issue advocates. Uh, we have members of the advocacy committee here today, and our leader, Doug Call, uh, Sue Carmen is also on the committee and others. And so, you know, I wonder, is there one thing that you, if there were one thing that you could say to an elected official about affordable housing and make a case for it, um, what would that be? One thing that I could say to an elected official about affordable housing. Uh, I recently had an opportunity to uh, participate in this program, the Education Policy Fellowship Program, thank you, <laughs> and had a chance to create uh, a model to try to help address the achievement gap uh, overall. And it didn't do, uh, it didn't isolate housing versus anything else. What it did, it created a collaborative, comprehensive approach to addressing many of the issues, whether it is uh, economics, uh, the justice system, um, housing, income, uh, health care, and building a coalition in a community because doing it only by addressing housing is doing it in isolation. And you still, so you put someone in a home, and you may have that one family, and they may recover and do well, they may not. But if you build a system of care, a systemic process to go back to address prenatal, um, advocacy for children when they are first born, their infants, um, a justice system that is truly justice and legal resources that is fair. And then look at the income and opportunity gaps with employment and all of these things. Any political person or politician I would speak to, I would tell them they have to look at it from a comprehensive program and not from an isolated only housing only or income only in order to address education and in order to make a community better, you have to tap on to touch into every one of those aspects. Thank you so much, John. Mm -hmm. Penny, what do you think lawmakers should be paying attention to? I'm sitting here thinking, you know, is there, is there some powerful statement that I can <laughs> that I can add to this? And not really. I mean, just that um, that secure place that's not just a house but a home with the whole support system around it matters immensely for for education, for connection, um, to get skills to be a viable community member, citizen, so it matters. Thank you. I think I, I think I would say two things. One, I would say, well, I'd say three things. One, housing policy is a mess, so you need to do something. That would be one. Um, the second thing I would say is we need to stop passing normative judgments on people who can't afford housing. So that, that would be my second thing. And then the third thing I would say is that affordable housing thing is not the same as home ownership. Um, and those are actually very different things. And, and, and most of the research suggests that home ownership and not and affordable housing is certainly better than not affordable housing. It's certainly better than homelessness. But really, there are a lot of benefits that accrue to being a homeowner and not just being in, in affordable housing. Wow. <laughs> Something that I would like y'all to really pay close attention is at the different neighborhoods that you feel like, oh, this is the neighborhood. If y'all know what I mean. Um, because these are the neighborhoods that really need help. Not that they need help, but it's that like, 
they need some kind of policy that will make sure that this is going to become their home one day. Not just like, oh, raising taxes or whatever. A lot of people will be able to afford it. Like, using the same example that I used earlier, more houses are being built for more wealthy people. And this happened in Chapel Hill, and like, if my family didn't have Habitat for Humanity, we will not be here in Chapel Hill. We will be in Medvin because taxes there is cheaper. And that's a fact. And if we're able to build more houses for these people who can afford it, why can't we um, build more homes for the homeless? I'm so sad, and like it angers me that Chapel Hill, we're starting to see more and more homeless. And that shouldn't be the case. I fell in, my family fell in love with Chapel Hill, and we never moved ever since we arrived from um, South Carolina. Because this is Chapel Hill is our home, and it's where like I get most of my education from, and my parents sacrificed to work here at this university so that we will be able to get the education that Chapel Hill is providing. Truly speaking, like Chapel Hill and Carborough District has one of the best education system, and my parents would not move us anywhere until all of us are at college. And um, I would really like to see more homes being built for homeless, for um, even like you talked about, like some people, they might be like hopping from couches to couch. It's possible. It's possible. Chapel has money. I've witnessed this. I moved to Greensboro and I've seen a huge shift. And Chapel, it is possible for us to really build some more homes for these families and individuals that are out on the street. Thank you. Oh, so before we open it up for questions, I hope you all will join me in giving a hand for our amazing panel. So we've got mics up here, and there are a number of students who, if I would, um, you all wouldn't mind helping me out, will run the mics around. So if you have a question, please do flag us down, and we'll be excited to answer them for you. Just say one one thing. So if you just like on a national level, if you look where we spend our money for housing programs, and this just you, what you said reminded me of this, we spend way more money giving the mortgage interest deduction. Like that's where our housing dollars go. So we spend like two to three times more on that on the national level than we do on any kind of housing assistance, housing projects, right? So we basically give more money to people like me who own a home, and, and I claim it, you know, so I'm not, you know, like, I, I write that off of my taxes, but that's where our priorities are. Our priorities are to give tax breaks on mortgages rather than building more homes. So just to sort of give you a sense of where our national priorities are, um, that's where we, we choose to spend our housing dollars on the national level. Any questions? My name is for John. Could, could you tell us a bit about uh, what is the source of funding for your school? Uh, we have um, both state, uh, local, and some federal funding. Uh, we are not a Title I school, even though we could qualify for it, but because we have such a small amount of students, we don't. I'd like to thank Deandra and everyone for sharing your perspectives and expertise. There's so much to this and so many different angles. I'd like to actually build upon Deandra's question and reframe it. You were talking about what you would tell you know, an elected official. Um, I'd like to reframe it and direct it back at us. Obviously, we're here. We care about this subject. What would you challenge us to do as individuals and community members to contribute positively to this topic? How can we make a difference? individually and collectively? You know, uh, I, it's something that's always on my mind. I think, I think forums are great to have. I think they're great educational opportunities. But it, it's really important to put boots on the ground, so to speak. I'm, I'm retired Air Force military, and it's uh, one of those people where if you're going to waste my time to just have conversations, you won't waste my time. <laughs> I, I just don't have the, the patience. Uh, uh, 
I think uh, as a witness, uh, not calling on Dr. LaFree so often, but he'll tell you, I'm just not one to waste time. I do what I think I need to do to make things happen, and I'll ask for forgiveness later. I try to avoid my supervisor later. But I, I, it happens, and he, he knows it. I've, I've had to humble myself a few times after the fight. But it was all great, John. It was all great. It was, all great. <laughs> it was funny to him because he was see me doing stuff like, oh, he goes again. But the bottom line, you ask what you you put, put get involved, not conversations, but get involved. If it is going out helping Habitat for Humanity, go, go for it. But I would once again say pulling together the resources per people, human resources and getting them actively involved, not just having conversations, finding where the gap is, and then going out to fill the gap. Too many times we'd spend more time talking about it and never coming up with a resolution of what we're going to do to fix the problem. And it's, it's sickening. It irritates the mess out of me. So I, I sit around and I say, well, I have this little gate I can keep. I'll take care of mine, and I'm going to do whatever I can. And just don't get in my way to cost me the stone because I'm trying to save these children, I'm trying to save these families, and I'm trying to make a difference. So what would I say to anyone in the community? Get off your butt and go to work. There's a lot of nonprofits here in Chapel Hill and Carborough, and their mission there might be unique and like their overall mission might be on something, but they work with the actual community. And nonprofits is the organization that saved my youthhood. And I know so many organizations, a few, who are in the process of helping people how to become homeowners, but at the same time, like, where do they even start? And um, go out, like Mr. Here says. Mr. Williams. Mr. Williams. <laughs> I apologize. My school, no. we call our professors by their first name. <laughs> uh, I'm old school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so like he says, go out. And that is like, we are so sick and tired of hearing politicians saying, yes, we'll do this, yes, we'll do that. But it's it's only conversation and no action be happening. And when I went to um, Little Rock Nine in Arkansas, an organization like these people with lots of money and they have the political power says, we're here to help you and I think this is what we should be doing. That's wrong. You should be listening to them and be like, what is it that I can do to help you? Give me jobs. Give me tasks. That's something that a lot of nonprofits want to hear. I, we don't want, sometimes we don't want your money. We want your eyelash ship. <coughs> yeah, I mean, I guess I don't, I don't need the mic. Um, oh, okay. Um, I have a few questions that I guess have been, you know, weighing, weighing heavy on me. Um, I guess my first question, if I, if I can manage to get it out in a comprehensible way. Um, so affordable housing. Actually, let's just start with that. What is affordable housing to you, right? Because to me, the hood is not affordable housing. That is the project. That is where the slumlords live. That is where the landlords who realize that they can get potentially market rent um, and, and still not maintain the property. That's, that's what the hood is. That is not, in my opinion, low-income housing. So I'm actually curious to see, you know, as you guys who have significantly more experience in the space, the educational space is probably the, the housing space, is, you know, than I do, what do you guys refer to as affordable housing? What is affordable housing to you? Is it systemic, or is it just where all the low-income people live? Well, I can tell you how the federal government defines it. Um, for what it's worth. Yeah, yeah it's right there. Um, so the federal government defines it as not spending more than 30% of your income on housing costs. So families that spend more than 30% of their income on, on monthly income on housing costs, um, then it goes up to sort of gradations after that. So the higher, so people who spend more than 50% of their income on monthly housing costs are um, there's a term for it which is escaping my mind, but like extreme home distress or something like that. So what the federal government's ostensible goal is to, when they talk about affordable housing, what they're trying to do is get people to spend 30% or less of their income on home ownership, or, I'm sorry, on housing costs. So that has nothing to do, because I think what you're talking about is more the quality of the house, where it's located, right? And so 
But from a policy perspective, that's not what we're talking about. They're just talking about can you literally afford this home where affordability is defined relative to how much you earn and how much you're paying. Is, is, I'm sorry, is the government providing this housing or is it, it the housing can be provided by just simply anyone that's So, there? So if you look at housing policy again on the national level, it's, it, it, it is a mess. So yes is the answer. So the way that the way the government provides, again, the, the most common way that the government sub subsidizes housing is through tax breaks for mortgages. Right? That's the number one the way we spend most of our money. We then do have a couple of different programs. We used to traditionally, uh, you probably all heard of the term housing projects, so that used to be the way that we would we have these buildings where, where low-income people would be and they would receive subsidized rent. Right Now we're more in the free market area where we give people we give them a voucher and we'll say, we'll sort of subsidize you, you go find a place to rent. The problem is, is that a lot of people don't want to take those housing vouchers. They don't want those folks coming and renting from them. So we've kind of shifted from giving people a place to live to saying, you go find your own place to live, which sounds like a great idea because then they have more control over where they live, except then they can't find places to live because no one will take those housing vouchers, so they all end up in the same place same concentration area anyway, so it sort of defeats the purpose. I, I don't know and if that it, answered your question. And it's, it's called Section 8. Yes, sorry. Yes. Yeah, so again, thank you, thank you all for participating. I'm sitting through next to it, obviously some two very bright folks that have asked both parts of my question, <laughs> and that is, public policy doesn't seem to address the issue around home ownership, which is more important than just affordable housing. So what can we do as a group to number one, change the perception around that, and number two, change the change the public policy so that we are actually providing what is going to drive a better outcomes, which is affordable home ownership and not just affordable housing. Right, and I, and I, I don't want to Dominate, but, but, but you're the expert. No, I, but I mean, I actually think that people would say we do promote home ownership because the way we spend our money is through these tax breaks for home ownership. So if you actually had to, again, we do actually, that is the main emphasis, is promoting home ownership through these tax breaks. The problem is, is that only applies to people who can afford a home in the first place, right? So we have this sort of bifurcated system. We have this system where if you can afford a home, then we support that through tax breaks. If you can't afford a home, then we sort of subsidize you with a series of, by giving you vouchers or Section 8 housing or something like that, and then we've effectively locked you out of the housing market. So I think some people would say, yes, we actually do promote home ownership, which in some cases is very true. The problem is, is there are a lot of people who can't sort of put that first step on the ladder to get to home ownership, and then they can take advantage of those other policies, right? So, I mean, I do, I don't know the answer. If I had the answer, I probably wouldn't be sitting here. but. I do think there is a difference between affordable housing and home ownership, and we don't tend to we tend to conflate those two things. And as Riri, I think, has said really eloquently, there's a huge difference between those two things. So, yeah. well, I'll just um, tack onto that and maybe close this off if that's okay, since we're at 7:35. Um, and that is, I think, you know. First of all, I think there's a spectrum of housing needs, certainly here locally and throughout um, the country. And so, you know, we right now, Habitat International has an advocacy campaign called the Cost of Home. And it's focused on this concept of more than 19 million people in the United States spend more than 50% of their income on housing. So when Riri talks about saving for a car or saving for college or you know, being able to take a family trip together or, or parents not having to work 80 hours a week, this is what we're talking about. And so it's, it doesn't necessarily, even the Habitat National Campaign is not directly promoting home ownership, but it's promoting housing affordability policy because the people who will ultimately become uh, Habitat homeowners or other homeowners they're right now renting, and they're right now spending more than 50% of their income on rent. And so I think we have to work in partnership. Um, and the other piece is that homeownership is a real shift for a lot of people, and so what we work a lot on at Habitat is the educational component of how do you get families ready for homeownership, because it is a different shift for a lot of families who are coming out of either public housing or coming out of rentals 
So we focus a lot and talk a lot about how are we going to educate our families, the people that we're partnering with, so they're ready for this investment, so they understand the investment they're making. And also, you know, there's mortgage and homeowners associations and property taxes and that type of thing. Um, and so we do a lot of that education work. So I think they really work in tandem. Um, and I think there's a, there's a need, unfortunately, right now for everything from you know, homeless shelters, which we have here in Chapel Hill, all the way to providing affordable homeownership. So we, you know, obviously we're working in this one space, but recognize that um, you know, Habitat or any affordable homeownership provider is not going to provide all of the need that we have. Um, so I just um, wanted to touch on that briefly. So thanks again to our panelists. Thank you again um, to Deandra. The last thing I would say is we talk, we've talked a lot tonight about policy, and so we have some very important elections coming up. Um, locally, we have very important elections, and there's a there's a hashtag right now on the national scale. There's, there's yet to be one housing question asked in a national debate. So there actually is hashtag our homes, our votes 2020, and there's a, a Twitter feed. Um, and there are lots of people who are signing on to a letter that's saying, please, in the next debate, ask a question about housing because it hasn't been asked and it's not part of the national conversation. Um, so that's on the national level is really looking at how can we get um, our candidates talking about housing and learning about what do they think about these connections and what do they think about these policies and the funding. Um, but on a real local level too, we understand that you know our funding locally comes in great part from our local jurisdictions. And so the people who we entrust to make these decisions are really important. So I would encourage you to do some of your own research before even our local elections and find out about our local candidates' views on affordable housing and how they would support not just Habitat, home ownership, but how they would support um, housing in our community. Because, you know, a lot of it is, you know, when you look at a real micro level, it's even if we had the public will, where's the funding and where's the land? Um, and those are real two, two challenges that we see here locally. So I just wanted to put in that plug for us as, we're, as uh, we're talking about policy. So thanks again for coming. Stick around. We have the room for a little bit. The bar, if you have a ticket, is still open and we have some food. And hopefully our panelists will stay and entertain a couple of other questions. But thanks again. We'll do this one more time. The last um, topic will be on economic mobility, so kind of bringing together these topics and thinking about how people can um, really become economically mobile thanks to you know, the benefit of homeownership. So thanks again for coming.